Diana Lover Durdunets is a multi-award winning dog health writer, vegan canine nutritionist. Please click like to help be green with Amy. Welcome, Diana Lover Durdunets. Greetings and welcome back, Diana. Thank you for having me back. Thanks, Amy. Oh, we are truly excited to have you back on the show. Uh, as some of you may know, Diana was a guest on the show in April. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes in case you want to watch that because there's lots of great information in that one. But in our conversation today, we're going to be diving deep into the benefits of plant-based diets for dogs, addressing some common concerns and getting some practical tips for those of you that are curious about transitioning your fur baby to this lifestyle. First, I wanted to tell you that I'm really excited to announce that Diana has offered a copy of her book for our book giveaway, and that is Plant Powered Dogs. And before the show, I was talking to Diana about this, and she said, guess what? I want to sweeten the deal. You want to tell everybody <laughs> what you want to sweeten the deal with? <laughs> I sure do. <laughs> so after about 15 years of formulation of fresh food diets for dogs, first meat-based, then plant-based. This is, I finally found something that is the most amazing product that I've gotten behind. And when I was doing the book, I got really into broccoli sprout powder and the healing benefits of sulforaphane. So I introduced a 100% USDA organic, whoop, let me put it, yeah, well, it's hard to see, but organic living broccoli sprout powder which is actually all human grade USDA organic. Great for us. I take it every day and great for our dogs. So I want to give away one of those as well. That is so generous of you. I, I'm so <laughs> excited about that. And I, we were talking about how we like to sprout. I sprout broccoli sprouts every day. And I never thought about using that because we make our own dog food for our, our pet. and I was thinking about other benefits and that's really great. And that would make it so convenient because then you would know that it was, that it was easy to just portion out and you wouldn't have to worry about it, especially if you it didn't sprout. It's it. And, and what happens, I, I, if you can make your sprouts every day, that's awesome. But what right. happens is after a couple of days, they, they lose their potency. They denature. Mm -hmm. So, this low temperature drying process, you know, eliminates that problem. So. Okay. Well, that's great. So that's a really great offer. And you guys are going to tell you at the end of the broadcast, we'll talk more about how you can win, enter to win the book giveaway for her book and also the, the sprouts. And we're really excited about that. But right now I would like to start off with our game of true or false. Ooh. It's time for True or False on Be Green with Amy Live. Answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below, and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, well, this is something that people who are plant-based mm -hmm. talk about a lot, so we need to find out the answer. Green Warriors, take a guess. True or false, dogs can't get enough protein on a plant-based diet. So you type that in your, in the comments, what your guess is, and Diana is going to tell us the answer. Go ahead, Diana. Yeah, that's totally false. Um, of course, they can get enough protein on a plant-based diet. Legumes, tofu, uh, beans, they're wonderful sources of protein for dogs. I do, I formulate diets for dogs of up to 120 pounds I've done, and we get plenty of protein. The key is when you're doing a plant-based diet, the majority of the calories, maybe even up to 70% of the calories in the diet need to be from protein rich foods. So too many times I'll see in Facebook groups and things, oh, I'm feeding my dogs, you know, a lot of sweet potato and a lot of kale. And these are wonderful ingredients, but you've got to accentuate the protein rich foods. Right. And that's a lot about what you talk about in this book. And you're going to talk a little bit about it today, too. But you really dive deep into yeah. it in your book, which yes. to me is, is just it's a wonderful 
you, you, you can't do without it if you want if you want to help your dog adopt this lifestyle. Okay, so going along the lines of that, true or false, meat is a superior source of iron for dogs. Hey, Green Warriors, type in your answers. Go ahead, Diana, tell us what the answer is. Yeah, you know what? I bought into that myth for a long time. And then when I was doing tons of research and researching the book, I discovered such amazing things. The answer is false. It is not. And I will, I want to just kind of read when, we, because I don't have a superior memory to memorize all these numbers. I just want to read this. If we compare the iron, iron content of various meat-based and plant-based foods based on a hundred gram serving. So hundred grams is three and a half ounces. Okay. We find that a broiled ground beef patty, which is 93% lean beef, contains 2.8 milligrams of iron, while cooked lentils contain 3.3 milligrams for the same amount of food. Now, beef liver is a very rich source of iron. It contains 6.2 milligrams of iron per three and a half ounces. But guess what? Roasted squash and pumpkin seeds have a whopping 8.8 one milligrams of iron. So the answer is it's just false. Now, people often argue that the type of iron in meat, heme iron, is better absorbed and therefore it's a better source. Now it is better absorbed, but guess what? Studies also show that it is can cause cancer in people and animals. And I write a lot about that type of iron and the relationship to cancer um, in the book. So yeah, the answer yeah. is completely false. Yeah, that's very true. I've been hearing a lot about that where there's so many people who are concentrating on these one nutrients or minerals and, and things. And, and sometimes right. we have to be very careful of the humans too, because that the same thing seems to be holding true about iron for humans. And, and they say that that's, uh, that sometimes people donate blood just to, just to kind of decrease some of the <laughs> that they have to try to, to combat that. But of course, you would have to talk to your doctor about that. You wouldn't want to just do something like that without it, without talking to your doctor. Okay. All right. So here's another one that's kind of controversial for people who have adopted a plant based diet. So let's hear what it has to do about canines. True or false? Oh, yeah. more yes, soy is bad for dogs. Mm. Go ahead, Diane. So the answer to this is soy is absolutely not inherently bad for dogs, but there are certain caveats. One of the caveats is that you need to make sure it's organic and non-GMO because soy is a highly sprayed crop with Roundup glyphosate, right, which is very carcinogenic, has been labeled as a probable carcinogen by the World Health Organization. So as a source of organic non-GMO protein, for example, it's a wonderful source of protein. I believe it's the only um, complete source of protein for dogs that I've come across. So it's got a great amino acid profile. Um, you know, it can be a top allergen. But again, I suspect, and I do a lot of work with um, a wonderful veterinarian who has a, a, a food intolerance test called NutriScan. And she is the contributor to the book. And as we suspect, one of the reasons that soy might be such a top um, food intolerant, source of food intolerance is, is because that soy in pet foods is probably or not organic. It's probably genetically modified, right? Unless you're buying an organic dog food and there are no USDA organic standards for dog food. So you're taking the word of the company. So if it's organic non-GMO, it's awesome. Or awesome source of protein. Studies show that it's cancer fighting. Talk all about it in the book. Yeah, that, and and they a lot of dogs do love it actually. I hope I'm pronouncing yeah. the name correctly, Justina or Justina. She said, my dogs adore tofu. I only serve yeah. them the non most soy. Very good. Yeah. I, yeah. I yeah. incorporate soy in our homemade dog food. And while we're cutting it up to, to prepare it, 
<laughs> our our dog is sitting on the <laughs> right next to us, and I know, and 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 he can just eat it plain. It doesn't have to have anything on it, and he right. really loves it. So, but it right. would be something that would be maybe high in fat. So we should be careful about maybe giving it as a treat for training. Would you say? You know, it's not as high in fat as these raw meat diets that people give, right? With all of the the meat. So, you know, like anything, you need to be everything in moderation, everything that's dog friendly, you still, you know, but again, it's a fabulous source of protein. So unless your dog has um, a condition like pancreatitis or IBD or reason to be on a low fat diet, um, you know, a reasonable amount, you know, and again, when we talk about fat, I walk people in the book to figuring out exactly how many grams of fat per day their dog should have. And then you could actually figure out the, how much tofu to give them based on that. Yeah, it's a great resource. And we, we use the book so often to just to, to look at the different way we're formulating different recipes because you spell out how, you know, what what percentages of the of be in these yeah. certain categories. And and so and I was surprised that, that fruit is kind of a, in, in the lower part of the percentage. So I would have right, to because so, right. I, I have to be careful. <laughs> well, you know, we want to be sure that people base their dog's nutrients on the amount of calories that they're feeding them, not on the volume of food fed, right? So fruit is very low in calories, right? So it should not make up, you know, even if you have, you know, a decent amount of food, it's going to be pretty low in calories. So calorically, it's a very low amount compared to the calories in the diet, which again, the majority of calories should be protein rich foods. Right, so we don't want them, but it's got so much water and fiber that they could get filled up on it quickly, right? Especially and that's the problem, you know, I, I see Facebook posts and have clients come to me with, we can say almost overfed undernourished dogs, right? They need the calories to gain weight. They don't just need volumes of food, right? We don't eat based on volumes of food. A cup of spinach and a cup of chocolate cake certainly aren't the same number of calories, right? So volume of food is irrelevant unless we know how many calories we're eating. So that's the difference of this book and a lot of other information that's out there that's not, you know, really addressing it properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that we really have to think about. Okay, we have one more true or false question. And of course, if any of you yeah. that are watching or listening have a question for Diana, please go ahead and put that in the comments and we will be asking her. So here's our last one, true <clears throat> or false screen warriors. Cancer causing viruses can be transferred to people and other animals by eating meat. That's a good one. I want to hear the answer to this. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Diane. Yeah. I don't know if any of your uh, folks have read Dr. Michael Greger's book, How Not to Die. I think it's just an unbelievably fabulous book that I learned so much from. And he was the first person that really alerted me to cancer causing viruses being able to be transferred. You know, and again, I just wanna read something. There was a study done and it shows, it's called the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition, the EPIC study from 2011. It found that poultry consumption was associated with an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's non lymphoma and B-cell lymphomas right? And that less than two ounces per day of poultry increase the risk. Um, according to the study, the risk of lymphoma and leukemia increased between 56% and 280% for every two ounces of poultry consumed per day. So, you know, now we don't know why that is necessarily, but there is that, um, correlation. And the other thing is something called bovine leukemia virus. So bovine leukemia virus infects the cow's lymphoid tissues, and it can lead um, to lymphoma and lymph 
liposarcoma in cows. Now, guess what? You would think that if a cow tested positive for bovine leukemia virus, that they would be eliminated from the food system. And I'm talking the human or animal food system. They are not, okay? They are in the food system unless they actually um, get the cancer. So the virus is sort of like the precursor to the cancer. Unless they get the cancer, which doesn't happen every time, um, of course, like I think it's one to 5% of infected animals with the virus actually get cancer. But then guess what? They go into the food system and they've done tests on the blood of people. Okay. Now, again, they haven't tested dog's blood, but our blood is, you know, this would be, there's no reason to believe that this would not be um, absorbed the same way in our blood, in our blood system. So they tested people and nearly three quarters of the people tested positive for bovine leukemia antibodies in their blood serum, okay? So antibodies fight off foreign invaders. So BLV antibodies mean that they were exposed to the bovine leukemia virus. And I won't bore you too much, but again, in the book, you will read why they have found that this has occurred through the food system, through consuming the meat. So yeah, scary, it's really scary. Yeah, it really is. And it just, I, I love how you have this study in front of you because it just goes to show me, which I already knew, but the audience are green yeah. warriors. <laughs> this is serious stuff. You're not just somebody that's saying, hey, let's go no. vegan, let's get our dogs vegan. Mm -mm. You've been studying this, you authored a book. Well, you authored more than one book, but you've, and you, and you really, this is something that you truly are serious about and you, and you are not going to give advice uh, unless you have had studies that you have really researched. So that's, that's so Yeah, I mean, the book is full of hundreds of studies. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm a, a geek and a nerd and an academic at heart. And, you know, that's why I got a master of science degree. And I believe that we need to follow science in whatever we do. And fortunately, um, the science is really in synchronicity with what also happens to be the right thing to do these days, which, you know, for the planet, for other animals. So it's, it's kind of nice when the science aligns with, you know, your values too. Yes, absolutely. Looks like, uh, I, ho I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly to sign it. So she has a question. Uh, what could be a good source of calcium for a dog with chronic kidney disease? too much phosphorus in blood, question mark. My female dog, 17 year old, gets all the medication to lower the phosphorus level in her blood. We switched to a vegan diet four months ago, but still her phosphorus level is too high and her calcium level is too low. Right, so I will begin by saying, while I can't give specific, chronic kidney disease is a very, very specific, um, requires a very specific nutritional formulation. It's actually probably most of the custom formulations that I do are for chronic kidney disease. It seems to have become rampant. Um, it's good that your dog's 17 years old, and, and I'm getting that in, in dogs that are much younger than that. Um, so you say you switched her to a vegan diet. I don't know if it's a homemade diet or a, or a commercial diet. There are no commercial vegan diets out there that are made for chronic kidney disease. And without a formulation program, it would be impossible to um, formulate properly a diet for chronic kidney disease, okay? So you have to reduce the phosphorus appropriately in the diet and do the medications like you're saying. You can use things like calcium carbonate. However, you don't want to add extra vitamins or minerals to a commercial complete and balanced diet. So, you know, in that instance, I would really say that I would, you know, I, you should contact me because I do chronic kidney disease diets. So, you know, if you don't want to feed your dog a, a meat-based diet, because they do make meat-based kidney diets, um, 
you know, I prefer, of course, plant-based. It's in the book, we have a whole chapter on why plant-based diets are better for the kidneys, an entire chapter on it. Um, but they have to be properly formulated. So it's hard to just, you know, throw out information there. It takes a long time to formulate a kidney diet. But, but it is something that you've done. And this is something that you could. Really I do it all the time. It's, it's yeah. unbelievably probably, you know, I don't know, it goes in waves. But I would say almost 70% of the inquiries I get recently are for chronic kidney disease. Yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, just a, Interestingly, it's, interesting. Yeah, but at yeah. least if there's something that people can do about it. And and have you seen any people that, that have had seen benefits in their? Oh, absolutely. Business? Yeah. I mean, in my you know, my business is is fresh vegan formulations, custom formulations. That's my primary business. Um, I am able. To, what the really cool part is a kidney diet is a lot of art and science combined because you really need to hit key numbers with calcium, with phosphorus, um, with potassium, with sodium. And I can hit those numbers that you might see in like a Hills KD kidney diet, but with whole, with a whole food plant-based diet. So yeah. you're getting all the benefits of whole plant foods without, you know, excuse me, the crap that's in these meat-based kidney diets, but you're getting the proper nutritional levels. You know, even my book, you can't follow the, that advice when you're doing something like a kidney diet. It's the most specific diet that there is. Yeah, I would agree. That would I mean, the book is great if you have a healthy dog and you're just starting out or, you know, if you want to supplement right. for specific things like this. Like, and and if, I don't know how many people out there know that there's somebody like you as a resource. And, and that's just <laughs> that was me. I, I'd be right on it, you know, talking to you because. It, and here it is. I mean, kidneys, right? I mean, they're supposed to be cleaning out the, the impurities of the body. And then people, unfortunately, are yeah, assigned meat. to these <laughs> meat-based diets, which are right. not, maybe they're better than what the other meat diets that they were on, but that's really not <laughs> not going to be the that's best. The, that's the irony yeah. of it, right? You're feeding the, the kidney diet that's meat-based and it's hitting the nutritional numbers. But if you look at what's in it, it's so bad for the kidneys from a from a toxin and filtration standpoint right and an acidic standpoint meat is acidic for the kidneys so yeah makes them work harder it's weird <laughs> so. oh my goodness okay well let's see alex said my dog has frequent U utis that be urinary tract infections i'm guessing can i give my dog cranberries yeah. prophylactically Cranberries are, will, ha, you know, I don't know that it'll prevent UTIs. Um, cranberries help to lower and acidify the urine, lower the pH, acidify the urine, which helps to prevent UTIs. Um, D-mannose is something else that helps to prevent UTIs by pulling the, um, the bacteria from the bladder. So... The short answer is there's cranberries are very healthy. I wouldn't be giving cranberries that are sweetened with, you know, sweeteners. So you can find there's actually a really good product called Cranimals, um, just animals with cran in front of it, Cranimals. And you can give your dog that. It's made for dogs. It's a 100% organic uh, cranberry powder. And you can give your dog that and try and see if it helps. I didn't know that they had something like that for dogs because I've heard of the D-mannose that I've helped some of my clients to talk to their doctor about it and most of the doctors are all on it for people who have the frequent UTIs but I didn't know that they had something for a dog so that's great that's great to know oh god they have every you know and you know yeah. when you talk about UTIs <laughs> it can open up the door to other things because you need to know you know if, if you have a dog suffering from chronic UTIs and the pH of the urine is too high. It can create an environment for um, creating these struvite kidney stones. So you want to, you know, you want to get rid of the UTIs. You want to get the urine pH not too low because that creates a different type of stones potentially. But you know, get it in a good about six point five pH range, and and the cranberries can help with that. Well, that's great. So somebody could just give their their dog these 
this uh, supplement. Yeah, it's just a powder size. that you add to the food and the instructions are right on the, the, the package, yeah. Oh, that's, that's wonderful because I guess once they have the UTI, the vet will probably prescribe an antibiotic and, how, and if you're getting frequent ones, then you know, right. chronically, how many times do you want to give your dog an antibiotic? So that might be helpful. Well, right, you can, right, right, that you want to prevent the UTI. So again, you can try like D-mannose, try the cranberry. Um, certainly can't hurt, right? Yeah, right. Well, that's what I want to know. Can it hurt? But apparently, you. Well, I mean, you know, you want to follow the instructions. Again, that's why, you know, this, that's why this Cranimals is a good, um, a good, you know, product because it's made for dogs. It'll tell you how much to give and right. you can follow the company's advice. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Ken. Hello, Ken. You know, Ken. <laughs> Hi guys. Great show. Should dogs be fed multiple times a day or just once in volume and let them relax and eat at will? Ooh, that's a good question. We say, but I don't know if I understand the question or just once in volume and let them relax and eat at will. But eating at will would be eating throughout the day, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think I, think I is the question whether they that, should be. Maybe that, you, you know, I'm giving you breakfast. OK, you're done or you didn't eat it or whatever. I take it away. And then later on, I give you dinner or or, or only at dinner time I feed you. And that's the only time I put the food out. And, you know, or should I just put it out every once in a while during the day and say, here, have some, you, you, are you done? Okay, if you're not, that's all right too. You know, I'll put it away, I'll put it out another time. I'm thinking that that's <laughs> <That's so complicated. laughs> I don't know if I can answer the take it out, put it away, take it out, put it away. But I will answer what he might be asking. Um, should dog, is it better to feed dogs, would typically say twice a day or some people like to feed their dog once a day? Yeah. I mean, that's the question I'll, I'll answer. I don't know if that's the question. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He's still on. Go ahead. There have been studies that have shown that once a day feeding um, is beneficial, is more beneficial than like say multiple time a day feeding. But I, the studies also come with some caveats, which I echo. That is, I would not feed small dogs once a day. They can become hypoglycemic. They have small stomachs and greater energy requirements than larger dogs. You, you need to feed them multiple times a day, right? Or like, again, they can become multi, uh, hypoglycemic. I would never feed puppies once a day. You know, same thing. Um, they need the constant calories. Their metabolisms are very fast. Um, Sick animals, you also need to be careful, you know, certain times with a sick animal, you might want to let them rest and, and let their digestive system rest so that their um, metabolism and their energy can go towards healing, right, as opposed to digestion. So that might be an instance where feeding once a day for a little bit would give them a break. But in general, I think there are so many caveats. And if you read the studies, they really haven't conclusively shown anything that I prefer to a healthy dog not to feed just once a day. Yeah, I, I think so. I guess some, some people have dogs that would just constantly eat <laughs> as much as- Well, you I'm, but, you're doing, but you're doing the same. Again, we eat according to calories. I'm not yeah. saying that you free feed them. I'm not saying leave yeah. the food out there. I'm saying have two meal times as opposed to one yeah. meal time with your yeah. proper yeah. calories. That sounds right. good. Okay, talking about food, Charles said, super hungry pup on commercial pet meat food. When I start transitioning to adult food, the portions would be smaller. How would it work with whole food plant-based? One of the beauties of a whole food plant-based diet is that as we know, what are plant foods typically? They're lower in calories and they're lower in fat than meat, right? So that's one of the benefits for dogs who are you know love to eat is you can get more food right i mean i'm sure you know amy you know when you transfer to a, a whole food plant-based diet you get to eat more right <laughs> i mean it, it, assuming you're not eating potato chips and ice cream all day right it still has to be healthy but again the sources of 
you, you know, we kind of talked about that a, a, a little while ago with the with the uh, tofu. You know, the sources of protein, for example, in plant foods. You know, say you're talking like lentils, chickpeas, tofu, tempeh, are a lot less fatty in typically, unless you're just eating skinless, boneless chicken breast. You know, than animal-based ingredients. So, and they're higher in fiber. Fiber, you know, reduces the calories. So you get your dog would, your super hungry pup when they become a dog, an adult dog would get to eat more food on a whole food plant-based diet. Excellent. Yep, very good. I know that my, my puppy. Typically, yeah. it all depends. Again, you can make a high, you could, you could dump a ton of coconut oil into a whole food plant-based diet, right? I know you're no oil, you know, but a lot of yeah. people love, for some reason, feeding their dogs a lot of coconut oil. You can make anything fatty but mm -hmm. assuming it's properly done like i show in the book they would should get a really good amount of food mm -hmm. well talking now that you brought up oil there are some of us that are sos free no sugar oil or salt so what do you think about the, that as far as incorporating that into a canine diet yeah and again so it's funny i talk about it in the book i compare oils to like seeds and nuts um, and, and I preface everything I'm saying here with it has to be dog friendly, right? Okay, so when I talk, you know, we need to be sure that we're talking about always giving our dogs dog friendly foods. Um, in general, you know, several years ago, I transferred over to instead of whenever it's possible, instead of just putting, say, olive oil in a dog's diet for the necessary fat, I started doing like cashew butter. Um, for the extra protein, for the fiber, for the extra vitamins and minerals, right? Because oils are basically fat. Um, you know, they certain oils have some vitamins, right? But in general, nuts and seeds are healthier. So, however, if you have a large dog, you might need to ramp up that fat content for the calories, and you might need to add some oil, some extra oil in. So, you know, everyone's an individual. Um, if you're going to add oils, again, I want to have people understand that coconut oil is, it has no relevant forms of essential fatty acids, okay? And it's a saturated fat, not that that's inherently bad, but the polyunsaturated fats, the monounsaturated fats are healthier for the heart and even for dogs. So we don't want to just load up with coconut oil. Even something like olive oil is better or um, like flaxseed oil, hemp seed oil. Um, yeah. So again, it comes down to the individual. Okay. Well, that's a great, great answer. And, and like I said, this book is just, you've got, you've got almost any question that I'm going to probably ask you is <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> <answer> there. <laughs> so if your question doesn't it's all answered. answered. It took yeah. almost three years to write it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, here's one. Jen wants to know what treats can I put in a Kong or on a lick mat? Well, on a lick mat, like, you know, some cashew butter or some organic peanut butter, make sure always make sure and again the dog friendly thing there's no xylitol artificial sweeteners or those types of things just 100 percent pure um like peanut butter or cashew butter is great i know my my niece actually does that when they bathe their dog they put the mat down with the, some peanut butter and he's licking it while they bathe him and he doesn't even care that he's being bathed so i don't know how they work that out put it on the outside of the tub or whatever but uh, yeah and as far as a kong um, I guess you can also, I don't really use Kongs much. My dog isn't really into them. I guess you could stuff peanut butter or nut butter, but also they make, there's tons of little organic and vegan treats out there. Um, you know, and I'm going to give a good website too called compassioncircle.com. They actually also sell the Cranimals. They sell a great supplement that I recommend in the book for balancing plant-based diets. Um, and they and they also sell some organic treats that I think a lot of them would be small enough to stuff in a Kong. Oh, when I say organic, I'm not sure if they're if they're all organic. I mean vegan treats. Right, that's a good source. Yeah, 
I, d I um, actually, because we make our own dog food, we also use the Compassion Circle. And maybe we can just talk a little bit more about yes. that. That's a very good resource. So yes. you want to talk about what when you're formulating your, your food at home to make sure. Go ahead. Yeah. You know, in all the years of my formulating diets for dogs, um, even when I was doing meat-based, there were always, always um, additional supplements needed. I know a lot of times people, you know, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear, oh, synthetic supplements or that type of thing, right? But, you know, look at look at even a lot of these raw food, raw meat-based food companies, and you'll see supplements at the end, right? If they don't, I actually wonder about if it's really balanced. Um, so yeah, so Vegadog by Compassion Circle is a really great product. And again, in the book, we go over the supplements that you absolutely have to have when you're doing your plant-based diet. They're going to be things you can't meet. Now, that doesn't mean the plant-based diet by any means is inferior because it's got so many health benefits. But you know, if you're vegan, you know you might take your B12, um, you know, or your your vegan vitamin D even, or, you know, those sorts of, well, you know, we can also go out in the sun for that, but there are going to be things that you need to balance it. So in the book, I run through all of those and Veggie Dog from Compassion Circle is, um, is a great vitamin mineral mix. That's a great product if you're here in the United States or in Canada. Yeah. It's, it, they have, they have some other products too. And, but I, it's not, it doesn't really take much you know, to it doesn't. I don't need that much big of a dose when I'm batch cooking to, right. to put in. It lasts right. a good long time, and uh, my my dog right. loves the food that we make. So he, I guess, he would is not detecting anything from that supplement because he loves the. I've food. never really had a dog have a problem with it. I've had people have a problem with it, like they don't like the smell of it, which is interesting because you know dogs, of course, have much finer tuned noses than we do. Yeah, but they, I've never they um things that we would never <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but I've not had a dog have a problem with with you know, and, and again, if you're not in this country or what have you, the, the book also gives products for people who are in Europe, um, the UK. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great resource. So Julian says, Do beets make a dog's urine and or feces turn pink? So well, they that's... certainly make our feces turn dark. Yeah, they certainly, I don't know if pink would be the answer, but like bloody looking, yeah. yeah. Um, so if you do feed your dog beets, expect to be scared because it's gonna look like his feces has blood in it. <laughs> yeah, so absolutely for sure. Oh my gosh, yeah, if you've ever, anyone who's ever eaten beets knows that. Now I have not experienced it um, and honestly cannot tell you if it turns urine pink. Um, I, that I've not heard of, or, and it, it, it doesn't mean it doesn't, I've, I've not, uh, had that experience with myself or with any of the dogs I work with. Um, but for sure the feces, it will turn dark. Yeah. So that's something that people can look out for if that is something that happens, that they shouldn't worry about it. And let, let's talk about, uh, going potty. How, how is it different? <laughs> right. <laughs> Tell everybody what to expect, right? So how is it different for a dog on the plant-based side? And big surprise, I cover a whole section of that in the book. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it is a common thing. So this really interests me, actually, because people who feed their dogs, especially like these raw meat diets, seem to take pride in the fact that their dogs have these crumbly little stools, right? But like, would you want a crumbly little stool? That that's first of all, that's not good for their anal glands, right? It's it's really stresses them. Second of all, and it, it it's we detoxify things when we, you know, stool is an elimination of toxins and waste products, right? So when they do transfer to a plant-based diet, you can expect to see a larger volume of stool and perhaps more frequent because of the higher fiber content. And especially if your dog has been on a meat-based diet, please don't just go cold turkey, no pun intended, to a plant-based diet because you will shock their, <clears throat> their microbiome. 
and they might get diarrhea and gas. And then you'll say, oh, you know, plant-based diet caused my dog diarrhea and gas. But it's a species of bacteria in our guts that ferment um, like different types of foods. So we need to build up their gut bacteria to ferment, to properly ferment the plant-based foods. So that's an aside to that answer but as long as your dog's stool is um a, not you're not seeing undigested food and it's not loose or diarrhea or has mucus or blood fine. don't worry i wouldn't worry about it so so I, i've often heard where people get their dogs groomed that sometimes the groomer or even or maybe even a vet would uh express the anal glands is yeah. there any any um benefit from having a dog on the whole food plant-based diet as far as that goes yeah i've had people say that they don't have to have that done anymore once they're on a whole food plant-based diet because again the fiber is moving it that through and it's clearing it out they don't have to manually go in there and squeeze them yeah so it almost almost seems that it is a more natural thing for them to be consuming these uh Fibers. I wouldn't want hard, crumbly, chalky stools, right? But <laughs> no. Absolutely. Well, this is very, very good. We had some great questions from, from our Green Warriors, too. Yes, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, so Tina said, that said we were just on the cusp of GVD. Mm. I guess that's gastric dilation in volume. Yeah. If correctly. Can a plant-based diet help? Yeah, I really wouldn't want to advise on a particular medical issue like that. That is a serious medical issue. Um, there can be, you know, the twisting of the of the intestines, which can be fatal. Um, and you need to oftentimes have surgery to prevent that from happening. So I'm just going to bow out of that a particular um, question. I'm not a veterinarian. And, you know, so I would prefer that the vet deal with that. Mm -hmm. Right. And that that's great. I mean, I appreciate you. Um, you know, there are certain there are certain tips that you can give to help to prevent that, um, you know, such as the timing of food, not exercising afterwards, um, you know, just different things. But I don't want to go and say that a plant based diet would you know, be the cure all for it. Okay. Um, ben wants to know, is it okay to use Nori? Is there a benefit? Yeah, and I talk about that in the book. <laughs> um, seaweed is wonderful, right? It's like such a great, it, it's actually a good source of protein and it's um, it's a prebiotic fiber. It's, it's So the answer is, yeah, Nori is great, has all sorts of benefits. And actually, a lot of dogs find it super flavorful. So um, it can be a great topper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now you wouldn't want to put too much in, in the food, right? Because of the iodine or, or how would that work? Well, that nori isn't. It's really kelp that is the extremely high iodine that okay. I avoid a lot. Nori has much uh, less iodine than kelp does. But, okay. um, you know, again, I'm a assuming when we talk to people, we're talking about not giving a bowl of nori, you know, we're talking about everything in moderation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And in, in the book, that's what I love about it is because you give tables and charts and show, you know, where, where you need to be as far as the percentage of the diet. So that's very important. Oh, it looks like Ken has a follow up. Yeah. Well, he has another question. Ken said, my dog likes raw corn on the cob. Is this good for them? And would cooking the corn be better? I think he thinks it's cool. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've actually heard stories of dogs almost choking to death by eating corn on the cob. I would highly advise against giving corn on the cob. And I would ad highly advise against giving raw corn because I do not think they're going to digest that. And I'm, I would be really surprised if it wasn't just coming out the other end as, as whole corn. Even even cooked corn, you know, as a lot of us know who eat corn is hard to digest. Um, for a dog, I would want to puree that up. Um, but I, 
I would be super afraid to give it on the cob. I think, you know, corn on the cob, it can be like flexible. I actually had seen a video once of a dog that had almost died from, from you know, they inhale, right? Dogs don't really chew, they like inhale, inhale things. Inhale. Yeah, <laughs> no, so I, I would be super concerned the dog would like inhale that, that cob. <laughs> Yeah. So what would you recommend for somebody that wants to give the, some of these dogs just love chewing on things, you know? So what would be good um, alternatives that you wouldn't be concerned about them choking on? Well, like dehydrated sweet potato treats are really good. Um, you know, there's a brand I buy that's out of Wisconsin um, and they're, they're big. I have a, you know, a larger dog. So that's good. Um, there's the brand V Dog makes something called Breath Bones. They're not necessarily, they don't last super long, but you know, they're more of a larger chew. Um, so they make vegan chews. I think sweet potato chews are, are quite honestly the most convenient. Yeah, I that's what our dog loves that. And, and he actually yeah. expects it. We have a, uh, when we want him to settle down so that we can, um, sit down and relax after dinner then he knows that it's time that he's going to get that or if i have company over for dinner i might give him one of those and 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 he's not bothering anybody for attention yeah. he wants to so yes he really loves that a lot that's a that's a good a good suggestion yeah. absolutely okay let's see what else because we have so many questions um, oh, okay. I want to make frozen fruit treats for my puppy. How do I know how much a serving size should be? Because I guess you would, yeah, mm, frozen fruit. Well, it depends on your dog's size, really. And, you know, when we talk about food, um, you know, again, fruit is very low in calories. So as a treat, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about the serving size unless it was causing loose stool, right? You don't want to um, puree, I, I wouldn't, um, you don't want to juice it, I should say, right? Because you don't want to remove the fiber because then it's just too much sugar. But I don't think that's what Stacy's saying. I think she's saying um, maybe pureeing it. I would put them, I think like a good thing to do is to put them in um, like puree it and put it in ice cube trays and then like dole it out like that as little cubes. Um, and you know, it, I mean, the size would just depend on, on your puppy, right? I mean, it's just a treat, you know, the bottom line is to remember again, like treats are just things to give in moderation. So you don't want to give, you know, like a cube of ice, you know, fruit treats to your dog. You want to just give one, um, you know, one or two throughout the day. Okay. Oh, this is one that's interesting. I remember before my dog went plant-based, we used to give him a commercial uh, dental chew. And it, and it seemed like he was very addicted to that. <laughs> so Lily wants to know, are there any vegan dental chews that are beneficial, I guess, for keeping the teeth clean? Well, like I said, V-Dog makes what they call their breath bones, which are really good. Actually, that's my dog's um, end of the night treat every night. He loves that. So after he's walked last, you know, in the evening, he gets his V dog breath bone and he really likes it. Um, you know, but there's no substitution for brushing their teeth. Just like, just like we need our teeth brushed, they need their teeth brushed. So, um, you know, but the V dog breath bones are awesome, but you still need to brush their teeth. Yeah. Do you think that the dogs on a plant-based diet have on a healthy plant-based diet have better dental <laughs> health? You know, I, I, I would love to be able to say yes, but since I like science and I haven't seen any studies done on that, I, I don't, I can't say one way or the other. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's interesting. Okay. Let's see. Now yeah, that we had some, okay. I don't, well, now, Justina had a follow up, and and you said that you couldn't give medical advice, so let's. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She said, if uh, what's your maximum or recommended percentage of phosphorus per kilogram or pound for a dog with chronic kidney disease? It One would depend the on the stage of chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she, yeah. It just it I 
I apologize, but you know, when I do kidney diets for dogs, they're filling out a really detailed questionnaire. I'm learning everything about them. We're doing a one hour Zoom call. Um, and, and, you know, that's when I then formulate a diet. I, I would be remiss if I gave you that information, not knowing anything else about your dog. Yeah, I, I, think, I figured that's what you're going to say, but I wanted to give her a chance because it must be very difficult what she's going through and she probably really wants some help. And I think. Yeah, I understand. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Best thing that uh, she could probably do would be to have a consultation with you. Do you usually review the medical records from the vet when you when you help? I out? do. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. That's all part of it. Is sending them the most recent lab work. We look at the the creatinine. We look at the um, the IDEX does um, like the SDMA uh, enzyme for kidney tests. I'm sure that all of this has been done. We look at the 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 bun, the blood urea nitrogen. Um, so while I'm not a vet, it's, I've done so much of this that oftentimes what I can also do is be like, okay, here's what I would ask your vet at this point. If there's other things, say testing that needs to be done, or I go ahead and based on that lab work is how I formulate the diet. There are all different stages of kidney disease. If you look at the iris, IRIS, kidney staging, um, they do it for people, they do it for dogs. They have various recommendations for different levels of kidney disease for the different stages. Your dog might have kidney disease, but not have proteinuria, meaning they might not be leaking protein in the urine, or they might be. It's all different. Like I say, kidneys, kidney disease is the most complicated um, condition that I work with, even more so than say cancer, because while cancer of course is horrible, there are no specific limitations, um, say, to specific nutrients, um, you know, vitamins, minerals that need to be achieved in the diet of a cancer diet, right, for the most part. And happily, most whole food plant-based diets by nature are cancer fighting from all the phytochemicals and the antioxidants. So, you know, the really liver diets, kidney diets, they need, you know, the ones that you'll go and you'll see the commercial foods making these specific diets for, you know, um, are, are the ones that require the most finesse, if you will, during the formulation. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's so nice to know that there's somebody out there because I mean, people who are on the plant-based diet, they, they kind of ha have learned over, over time that physicians for humans really haven't had much education in nutrition, right? I remember my husband had elective surgery and the, the surgeon said, make sure you get protein, you know, because he knew about our, our lifestyle. And so I said, well, how much protein would that be? And, and he said, lots. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> right. Well, that's exactly why I can't say exactly how much phosphorus to give. You. Exactly. But right. yeah, but but you're you're right, and that's why even in the veterinary industry, it's I admire vets a great deal. You know, when we go to our medical doctor, you know, you have your primary care, or maybe your cardiologist, you know, your dentist, your neurologist, your whatever is right. But your veterinarian is all of those right literally from the dentist to the surgeon that's what they're doing so it's super convenient and easy and low risk for them to say your dog has kidney disease here eat this hills kd or your dog has pancreatitis here eat this hills you know id whatever um it's low risk and hills has done the research you know i would be crazy if I said that a company like Hills doesn't understand the nutrient levels that it takes in these conditions. They have done all the research. What I take, um, I guess, you know, what I don't like about them is the actual ingredients that are being used to reach those, those levels. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and just like our human doctors, these great veterinarians who are our heroes because they really do help us in so many ways. They really haven't had much education in nutrition. No, but you know what? I understand why they're also concerned about people um, creating their own recipes. And I understand why they're concerned when they hear plant-based because they've been really brainwashed 
And I become concerned when I see what's going on on like the Facebook groups and, and how well-meaning people are, are using little charts that have circulated around the internet that are just not what they should be following, right? Um, your dog's needs go beyond someone saying, feed 2% of this. Yeah. And when I say 2%, like they'll say of the body weight or feed a quarter of a cup of this. You know, you know, Amy, that that's not how we eat, right? We have to look at the calories we take in. We have to look at how the various macro and micronutrients become a part of those calories. So I really almost beg people to please take the time to do it the right way if you're going to do it, right? Because we want, I want dogs to be healthy on these diets because then that just helps us to, to keep the movement going forward. But if people do, do it with a lack of proper knowledge, it's going to backfire on the dog and the whole movement. Yeah. So what would you say, and of course we're not talking about percentages and formulations, but what would be on a, on, in a bowl that we would give, you're not going to tell us how much of each, but what would we put in a bowl sure. that we would maybe give to our dog if, they, if we were preparing plant-based food for them? Yeah, right. So like the main components of, of the diet are probably a, much like what we might eat. Right. We want our percentage of protein rich foods. So that would be the things like um, like tofu, like uh, lentils, like mung beans, like chickpeas, beans, you know, kidney beans, black beans. That would be part of it. Then we want some starchy vegetables that would be like our sweet potato or our winter squash. Um, we things like carrots are great for also for the beta carotene. Then we want our non-starchy vegetables, which would be like some kale, some broccoli, um, you know, things like that, collard greens, a little bit of fruit, you know, dog-friendly fruit, like some blueberries. Um, then maybe some seeds, right? Like some hemp seeds are great. And then we might have to round that out with, you know, we with some fat. And that could be either maybe like some cashew butter or some um you know again like olive oil or hemp seed oil so you know you're seeing i think a well-rounded array of foods when i when i throw those out it's just a matter of understanding the proportions that these foods should be in and the proportions as a percentage of your dog's calories. The first things that the first thing we do in the book is teach you how to figure out how many calories your dog needs per day. Nobody does this. They, I see these things circulating online, and they'll say your dog needs to eat a cup of beans and then a half a cup of sweet potato. Well, how many calories is your dog eating? Right, right, Amy. So yeah, exactly. We want to start with figuring out how many calories a day your dog needs then how much protein they need based on that, how much fat they need, and then figuring out the foods that will get them there. Okay, well, very good. Wow, you just gave so much great information, and I really... Well, and, and you know, and I'm... I don't want to sound like a taskmaster, right? But it is so important to do it the right way. So, yeah. Right. And that's what that's why we're here. We want to hear about how to have our our fur babies be as healthy as they can be. We don't want to have to be faced with the things that eventually happen to a lot of uh, pet parents where they bring their dog in because there's something going on and that is saying, sorry, there's nothing we can do or what have you. We, just as humans, we want to try to live the best life that we have and we want our pets to have the best life they have and then be with us as long as they can, but in a, in a healthy way. And we're just so fortunate that you've done so much of this research and looked at a lot of research to see that we can enhance their health. Yes. So before I ask you to share what you do and how we can find you, I want to talk about this book giveaway again, and I'm going to be giving that link very soon. So, um, the Green Warriors, you're going to have about five ways to enter for this book giveaway, so you get like five chances. 
So talk a little bit about the book again and so that they know what, uh, what they're going to be trying to win. Sure. So the book is the culmination of almost three years of research and writing by my, that I did. And I think it's important for people to understand that I formulated meat-based diets for about 10 years before I went vegan in like 2018. And I was going to walk away from my business, from my formulation practice, because I didn't think that dogs were, you know, could thrive on plant-based diets. I, I bought into all the myths. So you interviewed the wonderful Andrew Knight recently. He was, Professor Andrew Knight, he was the first person that I spoke with when I was looking for more information on whether dogs can thrive on vegan diets. Can I turn my formulation practice as a vegan? Can I, you know, I was either going to walk away or I was going to be able to align my values with my business. And fortunately, as we all know, he does wonderful research um, and it's all in, it's, it's in my book. So the book is a culmination of research by people like him and others for how plant-based foods affect ourselves and our dogs at the cellular level, how it affects the microbiome. So there's all the science in there about you know, how dogs have evolved from wolves, how they are not wolves anymore. And I am not, again, it's not opinion. It's how the microbiomes have evolved, how their cells have evolved. So there's that portion of the book. Then there's a blueprint, which Amy has alluded to a lot about that actually shows you step by step on what to do to feed your dog a plant-based diet. So there's an actual blueprint in there. And then the second part of the book is um, plant-based solutions for common canine chronic conditions. And those are chronic kidney disease, cancer, which is what I was reading. That The notes I was reading was right from my own book. So chronic kidney disease, cancer, diabetes, food intolerances, and gastrointestinal issues. And those are the five major things that people come to me for. And I wanted to address those um in the book yeah it's just wonderful it's 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 a you, you're not necessarily reading it from cover to cover you, you're starting to but then you're starting to skip around and then you're then i was making copies of some of the pages so i could have some of the charts handy and and yeah it would just keep coming back back to it again and again and it's and it's just wonderful so why don't you go ahead and tell everybody about uh what you do and how they can get in touch with you how they can find you. Yeah, sure. So I formulate custom plant-based diets for dogs. Um, my company is called Plant Power Dog, and that's my website, plantpowerdog.com. And again, I started off um, formulating meat-based diets for 10 plus years before I went plant-based. So I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I've seen since 2018, I've been doing just strictly plant-based dog diets. So I've got a lot of traction and years behind me now in seeing the benefit that it has for my canine clients. Um, so I also see how much my human clients love no longer having to like uh, stick their hands in meat and feed their dogs meat. It's typically the last thing that they're doing that involves animals, animal proteins is feeding their, their dogs. And when they find out that they don't have to do that anymore, it's like, it's the same way that I felt when I realized I didn't have to, it was amazing. Um, so yeah, so my business is formulating custom plant-based diets. I also do other types of consultations um, and I'm continuing to add on different services for people, probably going to be doing a couple of courses coming up, workshops, webinars, and things like that. And the best way to keep track of all of that is to um, get on my email list for, at plantpowereddog.com. Great. And you're also on Instagram and you're also on Facebook too, in case people want to follow you in those. And we'll yes. have all the links in, in the show notes for everybody so they don't, they can just get right yeah. to you. One, two. Yeah. So what, Diana, what's your final take home message for our green warriors who have dog companions? So Amy, you know, 6 million dogs a year are diagnosed with cancer. Okay, 6 million new cases. And that's 
just, you know, we can't even assume that every dog that has a condition is diagnosed, right? So some are not even that fortunate to get medical attention, veterinary attention. For me, there's something wrong here when 6 million new cases of canine cancer are diagnosed per year. That was, along with my, my veganism, was one of the things that really prompted me to look deeper into the relationship about what we know between meat and animal ingredients and cancer and chronic inflammatory diseases, right? We're learning more and more about how animal ingredients create inflammation in the body, okay? So we also know that plants reduce inflammation. We know that dogs suffer from skyrocketing incidences of chronic inflammatory diseases. For me, a well-rounded nutrient, you know, nutritiously balanced plant-based diet hits, ticks all the boxes. You can reduce inflammation, you can prevent, manage, and reverse chronic inflammatory diseases, and you can be kind to all animals in the planet. So I would just say, like, why not look further into this? You know, yeah. why not? Well, that's, yeah, I love that. Well, Green Warriors, tell us what you're going to remember about this broadcast today. <laughs> <laughs> Type that in the comments so you can share it with everyone. I also wanted to thank Jess Tess Voice because she did the promos and she did the countdown and so much more to help our mission to get the word out here. And Jess Tess Voice, tell us what's coming up next. Lifestyle wellness is more than just what we put in our body, but also what we put on our body. And finding safer, high performing skincare and cosmetics can be difficult. Stacey Heine will talk about eco-friendly, safer swaps and how to apply clean beauty for a flawless look. Join us on Wednesday, August 30th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on Be Green with Amy Live. And as a special thank you to all of you Green Warriors, because you're why we're here, and you're helping us spread the, the word of this message to everyone around. And I want to thank you. And if you would like, I would love to send you five free recipes. Just go to my website, begreenwithamy.com slash join, and I will send you those recipes and you can enjoy them. And I wanted to also thank everybody for supporting this website that I have and, and for joining us here today. It's just so heartwarming when I see all of your questions and your hearts coming on because I know that you're enjoying this message and I really, really appreciate how you're all spreading the word by sharing this message with everybody else. And so I would love for you to take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and take your left hand and grab your right shoulder and now squeeze because that's a hug from me to you and your fur babies. <laughs> and if you want to join me and Diana as we sign off, we're going to say, my uh, tagline, which is the be strong, be well, and be green. You can type that in the comments. Are you ready, Diana? I'm ready. Okay. Okay. Well, until I see all of you again, remember, be strong, be well, and be green. Green. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, for Amy. Diana. Thanks, Green Warriors. Now Thank you can you. listen to Be Green with Amy expert interviews wherever you go. Listen while walking, meal prepping, or traveling. Find Be Green with Amy on Apple, Google, Alexa, Amazon, or virtually anywhere you find podcasts. Be strong, be well, and be green with Be Green with Amy.